Hey, Groovers, this is Tim with a quick note before we start this special episode of Behavioral Grooves. I want to let you know that this episode is brought to you by The Lantern Group, a behavioral design and communication agency working with the largest pharmaceutical, telecommunications, and manufacturing firms around the world. And by Behavior Alchemy, a consultancy that designs and delivers corporate and pro-social change initiatives through the ethical application of applied behavioral science. And now, as they say, on with the show. Good evening and welcome to a special edition of Behavioral Grooves. We're recording tonight at the offices of our host for the evening, Azul 7 in Minneapolis. You're probably wondering what we did with Dr. Kurt Nelson and Tim Houlihan. Hang tight. You'll hear their familiar voices shortly. I'm best-selling author and Forbes contributor Rod Wagner. But here among the Behavioral Grooves crowd, I am better known as Episode 52. (laughs) I'm taking the lead this evening because I'm the one who instigated the conversation that led to this topic. Over the past year or so, I've grown increasingly intrigued, sometimes concerned that behavioral science has reached a point of refinement and adoption that could create an unprecedented and unfair imbalance in the social contract between companies and the people who work there. For example, IBM claims it can predict with 95% accuracy whether someone is about to resign. Companies are experimenting with selection systems in which candidates interact first and longest with robots. Much of the appeal of a recognition system for a corporate buyer is that it creates higher levels of engagement and retention for less money. And firms employ IO psychologists to design environments for maximum employee compliance and commitment. They do so to improve profits. Whether they look out for employees as much as they do for the company is a matter of debate, just what we'll be discussing tonight. On the strength of the Behavioral Grooves podcast and their own experience in practicing in this area, Kurt and Tim are in a unique position to field these questions, drawing on their own expertise and the broad swath of commentary they've assembled in what, by my count, is now 113 episodes of the podcast. Before I bring them to the microphones, I'd be a fool if there were just one of me and two of them. So joining me tonight at the prosecution table, if you will, (laughs) is John Harris. John is the newly minted lead UX researcher at 3M. Before joining 3M, John was a projects director at Idea32, a premier uh, pro-social nonprofit organization leveraging behavioral science to impact policies around the world. He was also a fellow at the United National Economic Commission for Africa. Uh, Those of us who are here in Minnesota appreciate the fact that he got his bachelor's in environmental science from the University of Minnesota. But most important for us tonight, he holds a Juris Doctorate from New England Law in Boston. Welcome, Counselor. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, excited to interview two gentlemen and scholars. Tim is here as well. Um, <laughs> woo! But as you all know them from the podcast, uh, but for those new to the podcast, we'd like them to provide just a quick introduction on themselves, their backgrounds, and sort of why they're here tonight. Uh, so this is Tim Houlihan, and uh, along with Kurt, uh, founded uh, Behavioral Grooves a little more than two years ago, and uh, have a, my own consultancy in applying behavioral science to work and life and a whole variety of situations uh, with clients around the world, and uh, fell in love with behavioral science because it's the best thing ever. <laughs> So I have to state that I am really scared right now because we have no clue what these guys are going to ask us. Yeah. And they've set it up that they're, they're you know, it's a jury. Like, I, I'm, this is like, a, uh, I'm on trial. I'm going to be... Well, we've got a journalist on one side of us and on the other is a prosecutor. This is, <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is not my normal, our, you know, we do the interviews. So my name yes. is Kurt Nelson. I have... Uh, 20 plus years in working in understanding human behavior and dynamics. I have a PhD in IO psychology. So as uh, Rod was talking up 
first about IO psychologists and their work with organizations. That's me. I'm one of those guys that uh, goes into companies and works with them to help understand what it is that is driving behavior, driving culture, driving different things. And as Tim mentioned, we started Behavior Grooves a couple years ago, and I typically start off these things with, welcome to Behavior Grooves. My name is Kurt Nelson, and we didn't do that. I'm, I'm all out of, out of sorts. All screwed up, yeah. Well, All let's right. see what happens. All right, let's let's we'll let them run with it. We're gonna go. Here we yep. go. We'll, we'll jump right in. Let's lay the foundation. Homo economicus. For those of people who are new to behavioral science, first of all, who is or was he or she, and then secondly, is he or she dead? So, Homo economicus is a a term that was developed by economists to say this is the rational human, the per, the person that makes uh, their decisions understanding all of the potential consequences and options and is uh, thoughtful about pretty much everything that they do so that when they're making a decision, Homo economicus is making the most rational, rational being uh, it, it, providing the greatest um, reward you know, for the individual. Uh, homo economicus will al- always make a good decision. And I don't think they're dead, but they are definitely on life support. So, if we Ca- think about coughing up blood, as they said, in <laughs> coughing up blood, being you know, getting getting a you know input from all the doctors, you know, clearing and and putting those uh, charger things on their chest. But with that, there are good reasons for that to be part of the economics element. Uh, there are theories from. Uh, economics that utilize that that actually do predict some really good things. What is uh, one of the bad aspects about this is that it it doesn't explain down to microeconomics and human behavior. And that's where it is dying. And that's where Richard Thaler came in uh, and talked about, you know, the fallacy of homo economicus is that we are human and we are emotional creatures. And so that's where I think it's dying. I believe he said we're not like Spock. We're not that rational. We that, are not that's right. Spock. We are more like Captain James T. Kirk. Okay. So who, who stands in his or her place? Well, they, what are, and maybe more hmm. fundamentally... What are humans relative to behavioral economics? Homer Simpson. <laughs> think about Homer Simpson. Think about think about the guy that is you know you put a plate of donuts in front of him and even though he knows he like, shouldn't like, he's like, going to like, eat like. those donuts. That is that is who we are. Maybe not to that extent, but we are this. We are humans who have evolved with certain uh, natural tendencies that don't always align with our long-term best interests and don't always align with what economists would say maximize our utility. And the operative word is always, right? The, the homo psychologicus, the, the, you know, we're, we're super fallible and we can't make our own decisions and, and there's nothing but context that matters. That's really over the top. We're not just Homer Simpson. We certainly have a lot of Homer Simpson in us. But homo sapiens are a balance between the two. It just so happens that we lean more toward Homer Simpson than we do towards the homo economicus. So are we, uh, from a social standpoint, are we putty? Malleable? Y- yes and no. Yes and no. I, How malleable are we? We're more malleable than we're not. There is more about our, the decision-making in our day-to-day lives that is context-dependent than DNA and self-efficacy-dependent. I would add to that, doing a yes and that it it depends on a lot of the personality of the individual. And so if you look at different individuals, they are going to have a much stronger resistance to being influenced by contextual uh, incentives, other aspects. There are other people because of their personality, because of the mindset, the mind map that they have in their head, that they are going to be more malleable than others. So as going back to our Homer Simpson, right? You have Homer Simpsons on one side, you have your everyday average Joe in the middle, and you might have some almost Spock-like people on, on that other you know, end of the spectrum. We are all part of that big spectrum, and we fall in there every, every way. And in certain situations, you may 
more of the Spock, and in other situations, you may be more of a Homer Simpson. And a quick follow-up, then I'll toss it to John for a question here. Don't we have the additional complication that this malleable creature also has an, an inflated sense of his or her own sense of self-direction, that they think they're in charge of their decisions, and yet they're not? Well, just yes. ask, I just asked Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. I, I make every decision very rationally and very deliberately. And I don't make them emotionally and then, you know, rationalize after the fact, which is the, the standard model of, of what psychologists have, have shown to be one of our main things that we do. We will make decisions. We will make them instantaneously, almost before the question is done, we will have answered it, and we will have answered it from a gut reaction, a system one thinking if you go to Daniel Kahneman, and then after the fact, we are very, very good at being able to justify that decision, not necessarily because it was the right decision, but because we need to have a consistent self-identity and be thought of as having autonomy over our situation. We had a conversation with Steve Sisler about overconfidence bias, and he made the case that even people who are depressed or really deeply lacking in self-confidence actually suffer, still suffer from overconfidence bias, that it's, it's that prevalent uh, among the human condition. And so I'd be curious, and you mentioned that there's sort of a spectrum amongst individuals in terms of where they may be, you know, they may be influenced by specific uh, pieces within behavioral science or different nudges. Are there specific subject areas that are more improved by behavioral science or that can generate types of different behavior change? It's, it's a good question. <laughs> it's a really it's a damn good question. good question. And yeah. one that I'm yeah. thinking about. I think that, again, looking at the individuals and looking at the context that they are in, um, we know that people are more malleable when they're tired. We know that people are more malleable when they are scared. We know that people are more uh, likely to be influenced by outside aspects when there is a social group around them and that there is this social pressure. Um, given specific topics or areas, I think there are some where those types of uh, parameters are more likely to happen. And so in those types of situations, uh, you are probably more likely to do that. If you are at a rock concert and you are surrounded by 10,000 people and they all start jumping up and down and you don't want to jump up and down, you're still probably more than likely going to start jumping up and down. There was um, there's a researcher at the University of Chicago that is doing work on uh, what he calls magical thinking. And there are personality traits that are more likely to engage in magical thinking than others. And uh, so that that disposition towards magical thinking is more likely to that personality is likely to, more likely to engage in in the uh, ability to be manipulated for a whole variety of reasons. So let me. Uh, you'll notice the questions aren't too tough yet. You, like not yet. yet. Thank you. you okay. Um, although uh, you know, I've obviously been stumped. Uh, actually, just trying to lull you into false sense of security. <laughs> it's working. Uh, no, like I'm, any game show, I need the another questions, drink. Yeah, the questions will get tougher as we go along. But kind of short answer. What is broadly speaking? What is behavioral science? So I, I like to think of it as a mashup between classical, neoclassical economic theories about how we make decisions, how we as individuals make decisions, and behavioral psychology, which says, you know, we're, we're kind of a massive putty. And behavioral science is ultimately trying to understand why do we do what we do with both of these uh, opposing forces coming at us. Okay. Who is most interested in it? <laughs> I guess even as, as individuals who, who run this podcast and also who work in, in the industry, who is coming to you the most? Is, is it individuals? Is it companies? Is it, you know, is it independent groups? Is it nonprofits? Who tends to approach you with questions? There are a couple different groups, right? And, and obviously there's a, there's a lot of research on this. So we get a lot of inquiries. We, we talk with a lot of researchers who are doing the basic research We're, that are going in and trying to understand 
you know, how these human heuristics are impacting people, why, what's causing them, how they get applied. Uh, and those are researchers who work for universities or work for nonprofits that sometimes are doing this. We get, an, uh, the, the next group is, is business, right? And they're looking at this from a number of different perspectives of how do we work with our employees? How do we influence our customers? How do we build our systems and our advertising and the processes that we have in order to drive the behavior change that needs to happen inside of those. And then, as you said, there's there's these governmental or non-governmental uh, NGOs that are working on big policy type issues that are looking at how the government operates and what can the government do in order to tap into some of these elements in order to improve how government works or how the citizens of that country our community, uh, you know, respond to different uh, initiatives that they're they're putting forth. And so, it's fair to say there's a pretty broad swath. Everything from where do you put the carrots on the lunch line to see if you can get kids to eat more vegetables, a government kind of initiative. Absolutely, uh, policy. Some of it's broad uh, public policy uh, co- within the corporate world. Healthcare is uh, e- extremely interested. You know, uh, we were talking about Victoria Schaefer er- earlier. Uh, as a researcher in healthcare, she's interested in one really vital but kind of simple question: How do we deal with end of life, and how can we how can we make end of life decisions better through the lens of behavioral science? And you also have uh, programs for. Uh, moms at risk, how do you make sure that they go to their prenatal checkups and do the things they ought to to make sure they have a really healthy baby? A, a lot of this is exceptionally um, well intended to look out for the people who are the the consumers, the ones. Again, in healthcare, you look at uh, a lot of the work that is being done in healthcare, and it is on uh, how do you get people to comply with a uh, your physician's recommendations. So uh, there was research done a number of years ago that talked about, uh, you know, if somebody has a major heart condition where they have stents or major heart surgery put in, when they looked at those people after two years, it was less than 10%, about 9% of people were fully compliant with their doctor's orders. Behavioral science is looking to say, how can we, what are the factors that go in? Why? This isn't a matter of if you're going to die. It's a matter of when you're going to die. So if that's not motivation enough to change, what is? And that's what behavioral science is trying to understand and trying to say, all right, so what can we do to make sure that these patients uh, live healthier lives so that they are not uh, going to have another heart attack in three, four, five years, that they actually get to live a life that lives 10, 20, 30 years longer. Would it be fair to say this is a pretty powerful phenomenon? Behavioral science interventions are extremely powerful, it, it, unbelievably powerful uh, in, in, in some cases, right? I mean, context matters. But, uh, but when we see when we see really small interventions like uh, the difference, uh, a lot of the work that Kurt and I have done is in incentives. And when we looked at the difference between giving someone uh, an extra $60 uh, for the month for selling more Wi-Fi versus uh, getting a crock pot, man, the people that got the crock pot just really went over the top. And you think there's no way. Rationally, we would think that that's ridiculous. I mean, if, if, if I had a choice, I would say, well, just give me the 60 bucks. I can spend it however I want. If I want to buy a crock pot, I will. But the people who, who earned the crock pot just absolutely went over the top with effort and their achievements and their results were significantly, were like 40% better than those that got the same amount in cash. All right. Well, I will put a caveat on that because while there are some instances where it does work really big, you also look at some large scale interventions, some of the work that the British you know, uh, Insights team has done in various different pieces where they're looking at making some behavioral science insights in changing how communications go out or, or looking at the way that processes work or reducing friction and you're getting differences of one two three percent now that doesn't seem like a lot but if you look at a government component where they're talking sending things out to millions of people two three percent can make a huge difference from a cost perspective uh, from the impact that on the number of lives that that actually has so the the actual 
difference uh, in behavior that happens isn't always it's not it's not a silver bullet in most cases okay. it is it is a it is a nudge as they as richard Thaler calls it right you nudge somebody in a little bit in a direction and a little bit more in a direction where the power comes in is when you are looking at the various nudges that you're doing and you're optimizing this nudge that nudge, another nudge, and all of a sudden you get 2% here, you get 5% there, you may be a 30% increase uh, because of one thing. And overall, you're making some drastic changes in how people behave. So it sounds like you're, you're working with decisions that are happening right now, right in front of you, whether to save, whether or not to eat that plate of donuts like we talked about with Homer Simpson, for how it will affect you 10, 15 years, your lifetime down the road. Would you say that's, that's kind of the case? I, yeah, I think there's a lot of that. I think, you know, a lot of the, the work that people are trying to do in order to improve their life, right, is, is that we have a, a time conundrum. We are much more willing to, to do what's pleasurable and easy today. Uh, at the cost of my future self, who my future self is not me. That's some person in the future. And I don't know that person. That person is somebody who's bald and fully gray, right? And just <laughs> partially gray who is that like person? me. I don't know I that, no person, idea who that right? person, right? So I don't know that person. And so for me to do something to say, yeah, for that me in 10 years, ah, you know what? A, I don't know that person, uh, it's discounted, plus I'll start tomorrow. But for today, I'm just going to eat that donut because that donut is really tasty and I'm hungry. Well, John, is, is part of your question about making decisions or, or using behavioral science to influence decisions that impact us immediately compared to decisions that might impact us in the long term? Is, is, is I think kind of both, at? I'm also getting at that habit change piece. I mean, how much does what you're doing right now, does that first decision not to eat the plate of donuts, does that first decision to you know, wake up an exerciser to put more into your 401k, make it easier to make those decisions down the road and to keep that, that behavior change and to keep that habit formation going? I think it's one of the interesting pieces and one of the conundrums that we face with behavioral science. We have done a really good job at understanding some things that will nudge behavior. Once those nudges are taken away, the long-term behavior change that we see is not as good as we would hope, right? It's so getting somebody to turn down that plate of the donut today and you do it through some, you know, form of communication beforehand to remind you of your future self, maybe showing a picture of what you would look like if you gained 20 pounds versus not. And so, oh, I'm not going to eat that. But now, you know, a week from now, plate of donuts are out in that conference room. You don't have that nudge. The likelihood of you actually eating that donut is still pretty damn high. It, 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 we, we are not good at creating those long-term habitual changes uh, that come into it. Now, there are, there are yeah. people that are working on that, right? There's, there's I, people I'm thinking of Katie Milkman with temptation bundling and developing habits by combining things that we love to do with things that we don't want to do. Right, and you're looking, you also look at like Christina Bacchieri, who's doing work on social norms, and so if you change social norms around habits, so if, if everybody says eating that donut is not a good thing, I am going to be much less likely to, to eat that. And, then, and also understanding about what our self-identity is, right? So if we can align who we think we want to be and who we are, I am not the person who eats donuts. If all of a sudden I get that mind shift change, then I'm much more likely to continue that. So there's a lot of work that's going on in that. I, don't th I think that's where behavioral science needs to go. I think that's where we're trying to go with a lot of it. Um, particularly for those people who want to uh, to become better and to improve. I, I'm still a person that eats donuts, by the way. I, I can tell. F FYI. You, <laughs> you said that one of the buyers, one of, or one of the groups interested in this, is corporations. Yep. They're buyers. They're not necessarily researchers. They bring in an academician. They bring in an advisory firm. They bring in a research firm. They spend, what do they spend? What does this cost? How much would a, a large, let's say a Fortune 500 company that decided it was interested 
in improving performance through behavioral science, how much are they going to spend on an annual basis? What do you think we can get here? <laughs> <laughs> Let's anchor it high. Exactly. We're going to anchor this the high. Millions, millions and millions, millions, millions of dollars. Of dollars. <laughs> uh, it depends. Uh, I will go with the classic consulting answer. It depends. Uh, <laughs> There are a number of factors that go into this. So many companies, so you look at a lot of the companies that are out in Silicon Valley are actually embedding behavioral scientists into their work. They are having behavioral science teams that work with their data analytics teams. Oftentimes those are focused in on consumer facing things and various different aspects. But you look at Uber, you look at Airbnb, you look at Spotify, you uh, Walmart, all have behavioral behavioral science teams uh, that we've interacted with and, and worked with. And so you're building that knowledge base internally. There are a number of, of consulting firms, Tim and, and myself, each have our own that we go out and we do consulting with companies around this. Uh, ours is usually focused in around incentives and motivation and rewards. And you know, in those instances, we can come in and do a simple analysis for you know, a few tens of thousands of dollars into long-term really uh, working with companies to get at you know, root cause analysis and make some major framework and other design changes that can be in hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right, so millions and millions. Millions and <laughs> millions let's, let's for start Tim's work. Thousands, I'm the cheap guy. All right, but it's not cheap. Yeah. And if you look at this through the lens of a chief financial officer, he or she is going to want a return on investment. What do they want out of this that's going to pay for bringing in behavioral science? And I just added that, when do they want it? How, how fast? And yeah. <laughs> well, like all consulting gigs, they want it faster and cheaper uh, and, you know, and yes, with better right. results than, of course, we can, we can actually deliver. But uh, what, what they do want is, what they're looking for on a return is uh, something that gets measured, right? They're looking for some kind of result. And ideally, the, the best consulting gigs are able to link the behavior changes back to the corporate KPIs, excuse me, whatever kind of measures they have. I don't know. Uh, but, but, the, but the idea is that, that the, best, the best way to arrange for a, um, for a behavior change initiative is to link it back to corporate strategy. So, and, and to get more specific about your question, Rod, um, it always, it's, if the chief financial officer is asking the question, they need to understand that the business is bigger than just the numbers. That it's the people that are delivering the business that delivers the numbers, and uh, and there may be steps involved to get to that. Does that work with this chief financial? Like, we, I've never most, gotten past the chief financial officer. Like, well, let's not focus on the numbers so much. <laughs> you're like, well, no, let's focus on the numbers, right? So um, I will I will tell you that the one I, I've had a, a really interesting conversation with the chief financial officer. We were going in actually it was we, a program that Tim and I worked on, and we were going. Going in, and I spent an hour with with him talking about this program, talking about the ideas around we have to engage people, we have to get them excited to work, we have to get doing all of this. And he's like going, I still don't understand why this is working. And and we ended up, he said, All right, I have other meetings. Can you come back at six? So I came back at six that night and we spent another hour and a half talking about this. I don't know if I fully converted him. But he into... was but he he agreed. He, he did. He, 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 he saw the light to he the He saw degree. the science. He saw the numbers and various different things. That being said, we are typically not being brought in by chief financial officers. <laughs> there is not one time in my twenty <laughs> seven years of doing this work that a chief financial officer has ever called up and said, hey, Kurt, come on in. Let's work on this. We are getting brought in by people who are working with their employees. And again, both Tim and me typically work inside of companies. So we're working with looking at how the employees are being motivated and engaged and, and are working. And so, S sales, marketing, UX, yeah. uh, HR, those are the, the typical departments that are, that, are having, that are identifying issues that can be solved with a behavioral lens. Okay, so let's, let's if, if you don't mind entertaining this idea, let, let's do a little role playing. Okay, okay? Oh and my. you're so scaring I'm, me, I, you know, role plays. Ugh. Would one of you be amenable to playing the role of a CEO. And I'll frame that by saying 
there's a second question, so you might want to jump in and be CEO first because the other one gets <laughs> gets assigned a role. Who wants to be it CEO? It has to be one of us? Who, yeah, who, no, who is more CEO-like between Tim and me? Here we go. Who just lets like a, a show of hands. Who wants Tim to be CEO? Oh, that's a wimpy response. How many response? people want me to be CEO? Oh, well, there's oh, even that? fewer hands. All right, Tim wins. All right, t- t- there's a lot of non-committal people in the audience here today. All right. All right. All right. Kurt, um, that gives you the role of being the behavioral science advisor to this particular CEO. Are you comfortable? I would hope with, so. With this CEO, <laughs> I, this is going to be a hard ass. Like a, you know, like a different client? Yes. Can I please? <laughs> Sorry. And, and actually, um, John, I'd, if I can, I'd like to recruit you to be an employee of the particular company. Oh, okay. okay. Sound good? I'll consider okay. it. I love, well, I, I, I love this, that John and I get to be up against Kurt. This so, is good. The well, odds are that's good. That's not necessarily how the teams will form, but that's oh. okay. <laughs> so I'd like our behavioral science advisor to um, give the CEO uh, his elevator speech as to why he should retain him to advise. <laughs> oh. You've never done this before, so uh, it's you know, really catching you off guard. This is one of these aspects, though, where it depends on what the CEO wants, right? So, all right. Well, you could ask him what he wants. Yeah, there you go. Hey, Mr. CEO, good-looking, handsome CEO <laughs> who must be super, super smart. <laughs> You know what? What is it? Why? Why would you even be interested in, in behavioral science? What is? What's? What's your fascination with it? So I, I read this article. I don't know a few years ago. This Dan uh, Dan somebody. I don't remember well, his Mr. name. Mr. Dan Ariely. He's yeah, a whatever. very famous behavioral. Yeah. Scientist. Okay. I, I I don't really know much about him, but but I got this problem. I got this uh, this sales team that's not talking to the marketing team, and I need you to fix it. Well, you know, behavioral science is looking at the underlying motives of of why people do what they do, and so we can probably go in and help diagnose that issue and help you out. How about that? Sounds great. How much is it going to cost? Millions and millions (laughs) of dollars. But for you, I'll give you the I'll give you the, the low 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 discount. Of, hey, we'll do it on an hourly rate of five hundred dollars an hour. How about that? Are you going to buy? Uh, or are you I, not sold yet? I'm not sold yet. I think All right. I, I, keep working. I, well, I think I might want to consult with one of my one of my employees. I think I might want to ask. You Let's know, see how that goes. I, <laughs> I think I might want to ask one, one of my you know chief advisors that I trust about this behavioral science lens. He's a and, frontline employee, by the way. He's not like your CHRO. Oh, okay. So I'm taking you off the line to uh, um, safely, yeah. sa- <laughs> yeah, safely, <laughs> safely, of course. Um, so, uh, so what do you think about all this, John? Well, so assuming we're coming from the sales team who's not talking to the marketing team, we don't have incentives to talk to the marketing team. What can behavioral science offer in, in that regard? We can give you trinkets. Wait, that's a pretty involved question for a frontline employee. <laughs> <laughs> How about am I getting paid while I take my break off the line? <laughs> well, yeah. As sales, I'm not talking to marketing because my incentives aren't aligned. If I sell above a certain amount, I, it's just there's no incentive for me to go to marketing and say do more because I've hit my quota for the month. You know what? How can we change that? Even if we're not going to change the quota. Yeah. Right? You, you, can you help us with that? Damn, you guys are tough. <laughs> No, I, so I think that again, what we need to understand is what are the, how are your systems set up? How are your incentives, you know, designed? Are they designed to align? And and if they're not, why is that happening? And if we look at trying to identify the behaviors that your incentives are driving, which is the key piece here, right? We can design incentives uh, until the cows come home. Uh, with the idea that this is the most rational incentive plan in the world because the numbers line up and we hit our financial projections if we sell X number of widgets at you know X number of dollars and we don't discount them. But the fact of the matter is, is we have to get sales to be talking to marketing. And if that's a key strategic piece that you need to happen and it's not being incented, then we have to understand why are the incentives not doing that? And what is the what is the behavior that the incentive is actually driving, which gets to oftentimes the unintended consequences of incentives. And that is a big piece that we often look at. So you're designing something to do X, and yeah, it might do X, but it also has this counter thing of, of doing Y. Uh, and so understanding the 
psychology behind why it's doing why and then what you can do in order to change that. That's what we can come in and help so, you with. So, Dr. Behavioral Scientist, how long is this going to take? Uh, this can take every, you know, somewhere from a few months to, uh, you know, a year, depending upon where you are in your incentive plan, how easy it is to change, how readily available we can get out and talking to your employees, whether both your salespeople and your marketing people to really get at the underlying causes for that. So it's going to be dependent upon a number of factors, but we can probably start making changes in three to four months. All right. I got to have a sidebar with the employee here. Uh, John, I don't know if you've been reading the Wall Street Journal, but you know, post-recession, wages haven't kept pace very well. In fact, um, the St. Louis Fed in a report of August 2018 said, never have corporate profits outgrown employee compensation so clearly and for so long. Translation, um, CEO is getting pretty good stock, stock options. Uh, he, he's, um, he's got a nice jet, nice property in Florida. Um, your wages haven't gone up too much. They're talking about incentivizing to make you work harder. How do you feel? Yeah, Kurt, can you fix that? <laughs> <laughs> so this is so I, where I think you're going with this, Rod, is there is this aspect. Was I subtle? <laughs> you, you were not subtle, which is actually really good. We like this being, being forthright. There is this potential um, for using behavioral science to screw over John uh, from a financial perspective to get him to work harder because we offer corporate perks. You can get this recognition to go a, to a crockpot. A, a crock you can get a crockpot. You can get a damn crockpot and think how, how great that's going to feel. And you're going to work you know, extra hours, overtime, and different things. And we're not going to increase your wages, but you're still going to be satisfied by doing that. Now, I will. Now wait, wait. CEO Tim is like. That is so great. This is this is my man. I'm Isn't hiring this guy on the spot. I like this crockpot. Yeah. I don't have to spend any I more. Buy a money. lot of crockpots, <laughs> and they're they're cheaper than cash. So I, you know, it's, it's it's less money than putting more money into John's salary. So here here's here's where I'm going to stop, and I'm going to go. I'm going to take that step back. Right. So we work. Both Tim and I work, and you guys have all worked with with these people. And the the people that we work with, we work with pharmaceutical companies, telecommunication, manufacturing, a variety of of different organizations from a vast array of industries. Agriculture, right? We have a number of different companies that that we work with, and the people that we work with, I think, are not sitting there going, "How can I screw John, the employee, over?" They're not saying, I want to pay John less and get him to work harder. What they want to do is they want to say, how can we tap into the motivations that John has uh, to align his desire with the company's strategy? Now, that's not saying that they aren't being pressured by said, you know, formerly good-looking, super smart CEO who's now become an asshole because he has that private jet and he's making millions off his it's a stock modest, options. It's a small jet, really. It's, it's, it's not jet. a big jet. It's All a small right. jet. But they're getting pressure Just from them. Just means he's them. been looking at a bigger one. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're getting pressure from them because there are always the concerns of cost containment. So I have been working with a large pharmaceutical company that has had a recognition program that has been beloved in place for years and years. And uh, they made some corporate changes a couple of years ago, which were probably, you know, appropriate. And, you know, the changes were hard to take by the employees. Many of them didn't appreciate them. And now what is going on is there's another round of budget cuts. And so they're taking the recognition program away Totally, which in the short term is a really good for the bottom line. I mean, it's millions of dollars on that bottom line. I argue that in the long term, that that is actually a really stupid move by the organization because they have just, you know, with the changes already, they had disgruntled some of their employees. Now, by removing it totally, they have just made this undercurrent of this culture that, A, 
we are not being recognized for all of the hard work that we're doing. So not only is it a, a piece where the company is is being you know, looking at some of these behavioral science pieces where we're trying to add in aspects to make these recognition things better. They're just cutting it all out underneath. So uh, let me make sure I understand you. You you weren't talking about recognition in lieu of compensation there. You're really saying as hard as we're working, would it kill you to say thank you? And you take that out of the equation, you've broken the social contract. Is that fair? That's actually a really good way of putting it because I think that's, again, you're talking back to the chief financial officer. And as we we talked about earlier, and you talk about the social contract with the chief financial officer, and they look at you like, what the hell are you saying? What does that have to do with me making sure that my shareholders are maximizing the you know the share price on my quarterly return here? Um, but yes, that's exactly what's happening so is that social to, contract is being broken. Let me turn to our employee, John. How do you feel about this? Because we heard cost containment and you might just be that cost that's being contained. We heard crockpots, but we also heard if you work really hard, someone should maybe say thank you. How do you feel? I only heard crockpot. Um. <laughs> Well, and that's and that's you know I think that's that's it's curious because you have you have the crockpot you have the social recognition you have the recognition from the company you have the recognition from leaders. What I think is interesting is that it seems like in every company it's not an out of the box solution. You're not, and that's where I think sometimes with behavioral science people think, oh, just apply it and we're done here. But what I think you're saying is that every time you have to go in, you have to look at individual companies, social structures, what the incentives are, how they're aligned. And from there, you can potentially come up with a good solution. Yeah. And with my behavioral science hat on and not stepping out of the CEO, ethics are really based on social norms. And if the social norms within an organization uh, dominate, I mean, they're going to dominate. And, and so there has to be some kind of respect and appropriateness for the social norms within the organization. And I think that that can be bad, by the way, as well as being good, because there are plenty of organizations that, that misplace that. But things like truth and trustworthiness and reciprocity are all part of the ethical foundation for discovering what a conflict of interest is. Because you really aren't going to figure that out. You aren't going to see a conflict of interest in it, uh, when, when the CEO says, I'm going to save money and I'm going to screw my employees because I have the power to do that. And they're not going to see that if the culture uh, blinds them to it or allows that kind of behavior to, to go unchecked. We, uh, there's a whole, well, there's a wide range of CEOs out there. You see CEOs that at various points surprise their employees and say, by the way, I'm going to give a big chunk of ownership to all of you longstanding employees, surprise, or a surprise pay increase, or uh, profit sharing, or something like that, out of the blue that they did not have to do. I'm aware of a few CEOs that have even taken their, uh, maybe most famously Brad Anderson at, uh, at uh, Best Buy at one point said, they offered him a, a bonus, stock bonus, fairly large. He said, I don't need it. I got enough. Give it to the employees. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the, the head of Delta just gave huge bonuses right. to, uh, to employees. Let me, uh, but I'll, I'll give you an example on the other end. I was speaking with a, a, an executive at a large organization where they have a lot of parties. They have all the kind of things that you see at high-tech firms and things like that. And he said, uh, relative to the CEO uh, and all these parties said, you know, she doesn't do that just because she likes a good party. She knows it makes us a cheap date. Yeah. So what is the, what's the proper core intent? Let's ask the CEO first, and then I'm going to ask you how you can tell the difference as you're choosing clients. What's the best core intention of a CEO? Where should his or her heart be? I was inspired by... Um the current governor of North Dakota is Doug Burgum. When he was the president and owner of Great Plains Software, he would, uh, he, he and I spent a lot of time together because he was a client. And one afternoon, our meeting ended about five, five or six o'clock and we're walking out of his office and it overlooked the, um, the parking lot. And he said, you see that, Tim? He said, the company is going home in the minds of the employees. And that said so much to me as someone who really thought about the, the value that every single one of those people was delivering that I 
had implicit trust in his decision making compared to a CEO that is uh, gambling for uh, you know making the biggest bonus this year by jacking up the, the stock price by reducing uh, expenses. Those intentions are wildly, wildly different. Well, you look at Richard Branson, who has has famously said, you know. I focus in on my employees before my customers because my employees are the ones who are ultimately going to take care of my uh, customers. And so they, they come first. Everybody says, oh, customers come first. And he kind of switched that around. Uh, and I think that's really uh, important as we think about this, that there is a social contract. There is a social contract between employees and employers and part of that social contract is saying, you are providing us with a service and we will remunerate you appropriately for that and provide you a safe working environment. And I think that social contract is even changing to that we will provide you with not only a safe uh, working environment that's remunerated appropriately, but we are going to try to create your job such that there is a level of engagement and intellectual aspect that you aren't just brain dead, um, you know, for I think for many white collar workers. I also see, and this is, you know, one of my big beefs that many of our listeners will have heard many, many times before, is that the world is changing and that the jobs that we have today are easily being automated away. And, you know, there's there, you look at retail, you look at uh, you know potential truck drivers with autonomous you know driving trucks. You look at even accountants that are doing anything that is a pretty basic rote thing over and over and over again. Those are going to go disappear relatively quickly. And those people that are doing it, yes, you can go and find different jobs, but many of them that may not be possible. It might be you're you're in your late fifties. You know you only got five, 10 years left of, of work and you know, you're unhirable in, in any other industry. Or you may just not have the wherewithal to move from being a truck driver into being you know, some kind of IT specialist, which where jobs are growing. Or the jobs that are growing are warehouse specialists, that you know, it's the number of warehouse and, and you know, uh, fulfillment jobs is one of the fastest growing jobs out there. But that gets paid at twelve dollars an hour, and not twenty, you know, eight dollars an hour. So I think there is this massive movement in organizations to automate things away, and that is again that social contract that we have is no longer there because now you're being able to make profit off of an automated machine, and you're not paying for that labor, and so that labor is no longer there. Um, so which let me turn this scary. to let's to turn to our employee John. Give him a chance to ask you questions. First of all, I want to know if you're comfortable with this conversation between the the behavioral science advisor and the CEO, and and what questions you would have to to make sure that they're looking out for you. Because it it it, it does sound like there's that potential, especially within this, that these jobs could disappear. But I think Tim was saying this too. There's that intent there. I mean, at the same time, you're you're talking about. What do you do in a situation where if these jobs are disappearing, the company is, is shrinking and shrinking, you may have to get rid of a few people, but you want at the same time, you know, kind of keep that engagement. How does that decision happen? And can behavioral science really even have an influence there? Well, Man, he's an informed employee, isn't he? he? Is. Honestly, I, that's I, I, why we hired him. Actually, <laughs> so let's, let's call a formal segue here outside of the role playing. Thank you for playing along there. And let's, let's actually talk about some of the, the programs. I know John has some questions he wants to ask. And let's get real specific about how these well, go. Yeah, just, just quickly, the general social norms that we live under uh, around trustworthiness and truthfulness and transparency and reciprocity, these are the things that we look to. And if uh, if the leadership exhibits uh, a healthy dose of those kinds of things, then it's going to be easier for everyone in the organization to buy in and go, okay, these are hard decisions that have to be made, but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna ride it out. Yeah, and I'd, I'd also be curious to bring sort of nudges back into this too, because we're talking about things where if you know you have a good year or anything like that, what may come with a, a salary raise would instead be given away with, you know, a company water bottle or a vacation or something like that. So even if you're giving individuals the choices, but a company still has that 
that ability to, to kind of nudge you in a certain direction, is that does that still count as being ethical in a way? The ethics are going to be based around the social norms and, uh, and of course, this conflict of interest. Am I, am, am I, as the designer of the incentive program, really taking advantage of the people who are going to be doing it? Am I, am I constructing it in such a way that I'm leveraging uh, my power over them so that they either don't have any choice or uh, really don't have a meaningful choice uh, to take advantage of it? You know, the, the whole thing with a nudge, of course, is that people have choice. So first of all, is it is the aggregated nudging manipulative? Does it rise to that level? It depends. Another good consultant. <laughs> well, but right? if, it's, if it's a nudge, it shouldn't be manipulative. Yeah, so so even, even, nudge, even multiple should, it, nudges uh, together it, uh, should not be manipulative. So because, but, but, but here is right? where, here's where I'm going. So I, I think that the level of sophistication that we have with the insights from behavioral science is getting more and more and more. So we are understanding these nudges work specifically with these types of people. And then internally, the data science that we have within companies and the ability to be able to discern John's you know, personality profile versus Tim's personality profile gets to be even more uh, and greater so that we have that information and then we marry so it's getting those. powerful it's getting powerful and we, which we means can, it could be getting manipulative we can marry those two together and it can become very manipulative and and I am I am very scared of again I think 98 percent of people out there are good intentions and they don't try there, there isn't an, an intent to do wrong um, but I do think that there but are context some, matters. But there so. are sociopaths out there, and there are you know the people, the CEO who all he cares about is the bottom line, and I, I will screw over everybody in my company, you know, because I don't care as long as I get my bonus and the company does well, and they have the ability to now use this, right? And you see that in political campaigns, you see it in advertising, you see it in a number of different factors. So let me suggest one that's min what I would say is manipulative, but to the good. <clears throat> If I were to take a bunch of frontline workers and I were to give them, had a conversation along these lines just last week, I gave them 10 options for eye protection. We're going to bring in the vendor, lay them all out and say, pick any one of them you want. If you don't see what you want here, we'll get ones that do work. Idiosyncratic fit, right? I get, to, I get to pick the ones that I want and the color I want. Makes it, two things happen. One, he or she is going to pick something that objectively works well for their head shape and has the right ventilation and all that. But I also know one of the little psychological tricks I'm playing is I'm letting them pick them and they're more likely to wear them because they chose them instead of me telling them to wear them. Now, I can sleep really well at night knowing that they're wearing them because if you've ever seen a picture of someone that's not been wearing their their safety goggles and something came flying off the lathe, it's not pretty. So I don't have any qualms about that at all. But, so how do but we do make they have the a distinction? Choice? How do, do they, they have a choice? That's the question. Do they have a choice? That's the ultimate thing. In the nudge, they still have to have a choice. Otherwise, uh, you know, a choice architecture is all about libertarian paternalism. So it still allows for choice to be made. So, so the employee that can see all 10 available, they can, can they still go to the boss and go, oh man, none of these are going to work for me. Okay, and as as far as I'm concerned, that's that's still that's still, I, I would John, say John. No. Yeah. So in that case, to to what Rod is saying is that that it becomes not a nudge. What you're doing is nudging the ability to choose and, and get people to more likely wear them. But there is still a requirement, a rule, a regulation that they have to wear. They have to wear, but, but right? the, the truth so, is people put it up on top of their heads and they walk around the factory and, and let's face it, it is a Jedi mind trick. It is. To try to get them to well, wear and, it, right? And we had, so again, we worked, Which with, is a, okay. I worked with a company about uh, safety of their fleet pr program, right? And they had, they had one of the highest accident rates of, of any company in the pharmaceutical industry. And part of that was because people were, you know, texting on their phone. We got on the phone with Dan Ariely, and we were talking about this, and it was, you know, and Dan and his, you know, Israeli accent that he comes in, and he's like, uh, you just tell them no, they can't. 
<laughs> he said, "It's not. It, we, we're not nudging them away from texting. You just don't allow them Be, to text because it's, it's like, about safety. It's about safety. It's, it's about in safety. their best interest to stay alive and to stay healthy. D- d- whether or not they eat the the cookies in the in the cafeteria." you might argue more about the real health benefits of putting the cookie jar farther away from the from the front of the cafeteria but keeping your eyes healthy is is objectively better for human beings so we've agreed that this is that people are malleable more than they realize yes exceptionally malleable except for me we've decided <laughs> We've determined that this is an exceptionally powerful tool. Most times, or many times, yes. Generally. Um, We've agreed that there might be a conflict in the goals of the organization and the goals of the particular employee or the financial well-being of the employee in certain situations. Yeah, you look at the incentives of a CEO or a chief financial officer, what are they being incented on? So let me ask you this is there a code of ethics for the behavioral science professional as to how to make sure that they know they are doing right by the employees irrespective of where the person who's signing the check is going so i I think the answer is no i don't think it's it's written in um stone because i don't think that there is a a written in stone ethical code across every culture in every part of the world for every person. We have moral values that we oftentimes adhere to, but they don't necessarily apply to our everyday work uh, and the ethics, the way that they get applied in organizations. But there is something called casuistry, which is the case study-based application of ethics of things that we can agree on are common threads of based on things like thou shalt not kill. Pretty much every country on earth, every organization believes that, that that's a bad idea, so that, that killing is a bad idea. And, and we, can, we can take the threads from that and we can apply that within an organization and that can be part of the ethical code. It can inform the ethical code. Um, but Should there be an ethical code that starts so, with a kind of Hippocratic first, first do no harm and that there are, uh, survey researchers have a code of ethics that says we won't, indivi- we won't identify individual respondents within, uh, uh, particularly when you're tracking how many steps I took and my heartbeat and all that? I yeah, there yes. not be one. Yeah, yeah. I, I, no, so that was, you were going exactly where I was going. I'm going, is, is there a need for... A Hippocratic Oath for behavioral scientists. Not having thought about this much, my gut reaction, right, and I will rationalize this later uh, after the fact, is yes, I think there should be. I think that that would be beneficial uh, across the board. Now, there's probably some well, but, unintended well, do, consequences. Well, do you think that it should be one for everything? Like, everybody should have... Because I, I, I don't believe that we should have one that applies to everything, because I think context matters. But I think there are certain undeniable pieces of do no harm. First, do no harm. That we can all just say, this is a level set. Right? That this is... Uh, the piece of that is now I don't know what that is and I don't know if we can get there to get to that that element and that level of is it going to be so general and broad that it's going to be meaningless is it going to be such that we have you know it's so narrow and tight that nobody can even apply it so where is that and it might need to be different it might need to be different in you know this culture versus that culture that being said I I think it should be something we look into. I, I, I was just, yeah, I'm curious about John because you've worked in Southeast Asia, you've worked in Africa with, with a lot of different programs. Well, that's right. Like, you, like Kurt was saying, it seems like it's, you know, there's a broad sense to it, but then you also have to narrow it down and it's going to be context specific. It's going to be in individual situations. And so, yeah, it, does, it, does it start with each project coming in and, and trying to determine that? Or is there something that we can really have a... a High level across behavioral science code of ethics. That's that's tough. I'd turn that back to you guys. We have saved our toughest question for last. Oh God! A hypothetical. <sighs> Let's assume that 
my beer is empty. You know this, right? <laughs> this is like I am, I am all out of liquid uh, encouragement. Let's assume that the employees of a large organization, let's say 20,000 or so, have pooled their money and they've decided that they would like the benefit of a behavioral and science advisor. And so the client is not the CEO, not the CFO, not the CHRO. It is the employees of the organization and they come to you, Kurt and Tim, Please advise us, what do we need to understand about behavioral science to get the most out of our lives? I would be all over that. Um, and I would say be what you like the client. I'm not saying what, you're, what would your I, advice I'm be? Like, I'm like, uh, yes, hire us. We will, we will help you. I, I think there are lots of things that we can look at. Because, again, uh, one of the things that we talk about on, on Behavioral Grooves is, is applying behavioral science to work and life. Right? And so... There are things that we can do in our own work that is, that's going to make that work more engaging for us, more resonating with who we are and what we want. There are also influence uh, tactics that we can use to influence up inside of the organization. Okay, I want to pin you down a little bit more, though, but let's get to specific advice. So let's start with, how, would you say... Don't take the crock pot. Ask for 500 bucks. No. 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 I no. would say take but the I would crock pot and ask for 500 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> the crock pot is actually, so, so this, is, this is where it gets to be very interesting. And, and I'm getting excited about this. Sorry. The crock pot is actually driving an innate uh, uh, motivation inside many people. Uh, which is not a not necessarily a bad thing. It gets you excited to go to work. And Crackpot is a really horrible example of this. But you, you know, you can think of golf clubs or whatever it is that. Well, that would you, for you example, both. start with? Would you say to this employee group, "Let's first look at your compensation and make sure you're being paid fairly." And Context if and, and if you are, then we'll worry about some like hedonic awards that you rewards that you could have. But we're going to start by looking at your compensation, exactly. Which is not necessarily where a lot of incentive firms start. Oh, I, and oh, it's not a lot where I think where many of the non-cash incentive firms start, right? Okay. I, I think if you look at organizations, one of the things that we always talk about when we're talking incentives is, is all right, so what are we? Are we coming in at the 50th percentile, 75th percentile? Very rarely do I ever hear companies want to come in you know, at the 25th percentile, but there are companies that obviously do that, right, on, on overall pay. So, yes. You need to look at your pay. You need to look at how many hours are you working. Okay, uh, yeah, I want to go there. Uh, that's exactly where I was going to go next. Would you maybe for the employee group say, it's really great that they have a cafeteria and they'll pick up your dry clean and all that, but let's look at how much time you're spending on campus. And are you able to get a good night of sleep and go to your kid's hockey game and all that? And so we're going to help you look away from the nice meal that they're serving in the evening. Instead, say, we're going to advise you, go home. There's yes, yes, uh, uh, all that has to be, and so it is context, context matters. Context is so much of what drives our behavior that unless we're looking at the total story that uh, we're going to be missing out on whatever kind of advice could come from it. This could be a great client, though, to have the employees raise their hand and say, we want to hire you to better understand what we should do. I, having the question come from that part of the organization would be fantastic. Where else might your advice differ dramatically or slightly from what you would tell the CHRO, for example? So one of the things is to really to understand what are the things that are actually influencing you. So what is driving your behavior? What is driving your attitudes? And oftentimes when you're working for the organization, you don't necessarily want the employees to understand that, right? Because they're being, they just need to be motivated. They don't need to understand that, hey, this crock pot is really the thing that's getting me to work extra five hours. But you want the employee to understand that so they can make that choice. So I was facetious earlier in talking about, you know, no, get rid of the crock pot. It is a context matters. You know, for some employees, that crock pot might not be the right thing to motivate them. They might need to have more time off. They might need to be able to spend more time with their kid. They might need to have more money. They might need to have a number of other things. And if you don't understand what it is that is actually driving you to feel like you have to stay and work, then you are at a disadvantage compared to the employer. Behavioral science is behavioral science. I don't think that it, it should cut along political lines or institutional lines. It should be neutral. And whether or not the recommendations are going to the CHRO or to the employee group, 
the recommendations should be the same if they're founded in behavioral science. Kurt and Tim, thank you so much for letting us turn the tables on you. Take captive your, your podcast. You've been great sports, and this has been just a fascinating conversation. Awesome. We want to thank you again. We want to thank Azul7. We want to thank everyone for showing up tonight. We want to thank Rod as an excellent moderator, and of course, thank Tim and Kurt for a great conversation. All Thanks, right. everybody. Thank you. Time for a beer. Thank you.